In this lesson, we'll take a look at the concepts of limits and continuity. Uh, continuity where a graph is continuous or not continuous. It's said to be discontinuous. And we'll take a look at that actually in this example right here. We're asked to sketch this graph and find any points where it's discontinuous. Now, this is a piecewise function because it has three different parts. Uh, the function has the characteristic of negative x squared, or the uh, function of negative x squared, where x is less than 0, f of x equals x between 0 and 2 inclusive, and the function equals 2x minus 1 for x values larger than 2. Now, I'm going to start with this part right here, and there's no particular reason. I'm just going to start with that. Uh, probably because it's the simplest part to graph. f of x equals x, so if x is 0, um, the y value or function value is 0. If x is 1, the y value is 1, because f of x just equals whatever x is. So for example, if we start on the right side where x is 2, f of x equals 2, so the function equals 2. Um, if x is 1, the function also equals 1. If x is 0, the function also equals 0. So right here between 0 and 2 inclusive, um, the every ordered pair, the x and y coordinates are the same. That's what f of x equals x means. Now, uh, let's go to this part here, the uh, quadratic part, where, where x is less than 0, it's a, a parabola that opens downward, negative x squared. So, for example, if I were to substitute negative 1 in place of x, negative 1, negative 1 squared would be negative 1. Uh, if we uh, square negative 2 and then change the sign, negative 2 squared is... 4, and then this makes it negative 4. So negative 2, negative 4 would be a point in the graph. So the graph comes down here. Now, this part here, it says where x is less than 0. So where x is 0, there's actually an open dot at the end of this. Uh, the open dot means that the graph doesn't actually exist there, but it does to the immediate left of it. But So if I put 0 here in place of x, 0 squared is 0, and of course negative 0 is still 0. So there's actually an open circle right here at the um, right end of the parabola, but because that open circle coincides with where this graph starts or ends, um, we don't actually bother putting an open circle there. So, and of course this keeps on going down forever. Now, uh, what happens to the right of 2? Because uh, x is 2 is, is this point right here. Uh, where x is greater than 2, uh, where the function equals 2x minus 1. So if I were, for example, to put 3 in there, 2 times 3 minus 1 would be 5. So the point 3, 5 would be on the graph. Now, where x actually equals 2, now this says x is greater than 2, So, but x can be just very, very slightly larger than 2. And so we put an open circle at the uh, where x is 2 here. If I actually substitute 2 in place of x, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. So that would be this point right here. Now the open circle means that that point actually isn't on the graph, but points to the immediate right of it, just very slightly uh, to the right of it would be. Uh, for example, if I were to take a number very slightly larger than uh, 2. So for example, if I use 2.01, that's very slightly larger than 2. And I put that in place of x. So we would go 2 times 2.01 minus 1. So that would equal 4.02 minus 1, which would be 3.02. So that would be, so this was the x coordinate 2.01 comma 3.02 and so that's a point in the graph now so that's probably like right about there you know it's just very slightly to the right of that open circle so that's why the open circle we actually have uh, used that to indicate sort of where it starts and where it doesn't actually not actually a point on the graph but the graph goes to the right of it now uh, otherwise, this is a line with a slope of 2. Remember y equals mx plus b? The 2 is the slope. So for example, if we start here and go over 1, we would go up 2 and there's another point in the graph. Over 1 and up 2 and there's another point. So that's why it goes to the right and up like that. So that's what the graph looks like. Now, notice there's a break or jump in the graph here. So where x equals 2, there's a break in the graph. So let's limit, uh, and that's our function, let's uh, evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 from the left and the right. 
Now, this, this means as x approaches 2 from the left side, that's not a negative 2. And this is supposed is a plus here. It's almost hard to see it as x approaches 2 from the positive side. Now, as x approaches 2 from the negative side, that means as you're coming along the graph here, getting close to where x is 2, notice when you get close to where x is 2 here, the y value or function value is 2. So that's why that limit would be 2. Now, this means as x approaches 2 from the right side, so to the, from the right side of 2, as you come down here, see this is where x is 2 here, to the right, from the right side of 2 means we're coming down like this, and the y value is getting close to 3. So we say that the left-hand limit is 2 and the right-hand limit is 3. And because they're not the same, that means that the limit as x approaches 2 does not exist. If you see the abbreviation DNE, that stands for does not exist. And then we would say where x equals 2, the graph is discontinuous. So if you find a place on a graph where there's a break like that, or the right and left hand limits at that particular number, like 2, are not the same, then the graph is said to be discontinuous. On this page, before we get into a few examples, are several properties of limits listed. And uh, the first one says the limit of c equals c as x approaches b. Uh, c here is meant to represent a constant. And so it doesn't matter what x approaches, b or any other value, the limit of a constant equals the constant. And that's what this says here. The limit of a constant, no matter what x approaches, equals the constant. Now, if we change it so it's the limit of x as x approaches b, that would equal b because you see it's x getting closer to the value of b, so this limit should equal whatever that number b is. So the limit of x as x approaches b is equal to b. If you have the limit of a sum or a difference, the limit as x approaches b of f of x, now I'll say plus g of x, is equal to the limit of f of x plus the limit of g of x. If there's a subtraction symbol between here, if it's the uh, limit as x approaches b of f of x minus g of x, then it would be the limit of f of x minus the limit of g of x. Of course, all these are as x approaches b. So the limit of a sum or of a difference equals the sum of the individual limits or the difference of the individual limits. Now, if you have the limit of some constant c times a function, then as long as that c is independent or unrelated to x, it can be factored out of the limit. So we can write this as c times the limit of f of x as x approaches b. Very similar to this sum and difference one, if you have the limit of a product of two functions, it's equal to the, and there's an implied multiplication right here, it's equal to the product of the two individual limits. So the limit of a product equals the product of the limits. Same is true for a quotient. If you have a limit of a quotient, f of x over g of x, it's equal to the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. And of course, provided that the limit and the denominator is not equal to zero, has a non-zero value. The limit of a power of a function is equal to the power of the limit. So the limit of a power equals the power of the limit. And very similar with roots, the limit of a uh, the nth root of a function is equal to the nth root of the limit of the function. Now, provided that this limit in here is greater than or equal to zero if n is even, if the root is even. Remember, you can take the uh, odd root of a negative, but you cannot take the even root of a negative within the real numbers. So there are several properties of limits described. And we're going to take a look at some examples on this page and actually two more in the next, just evaluating limits. So this says uh, evaluate the limit of 3x squared minus 2x as x approaches 2. Now, it's meant uh, that there are, I, don't, I didn't put brackets here, but we're taking the limit of this whole function, so I probably should have had brackets around there. So we're just substituting 2 in place of x. Now, x, when it says x approaches 2, that means that x is getting very, very close to 2. x doesn't actually equal 2. But when we substitute 2 in, it'll tell us what the function is approaching. So 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12. And of course, 2 times 2 is 4. 12 minus 4 would equal 8. So as x approaches 2, the limit of this expression is approaching a value of 8. Now in b, pi is a constant. So pi squared is also a constant. So it really doesn't matter what x is tending towards. x could tend towards 0 or a half or you know, 2053, it wouldn't matter. Uh, 
that the limit would just be equal to pi squared. And that's that, I believe it's the second property from the previous page. The limit of a, oh no, it's the first one. The limit of a constant as x approaches any value is equal to the constant. In C here, as x approaches 2, so we have 4 times 2 squared over 2 minus 2. Now in the denominator, 2 minus 2 is 0. Uh, 2 squared is 4 times 4 is 16. And remember, in the, in the real numbers, or actually it's not defined uh, to be able to divide by 0, actually in any number system. So that's undefined. So then we would say that this limit does not exist. Now in D here, if x approaches negative 3, what happens when we substitute negative 3 in here? Well, of course, when we put negative 3 in the denominator, negative 3 plus 3, that works out to 0. Okay, so right now it kind of looks like uh, this example C over here. But if we put negative 3 in place of x, see that's 9 minus 21 plus 12. So notice that the numerator also works out to a value of 0. So basically when you put negative 3 in place of x, you get 0 on the, in the numerator and 0 in the denominator. And that's said to be an indeterminate form. So that means that the limit probably is going to exist, and I'll show you how to find it here. It's not one of the does not exist like c. See the difference in c here is because it was 16. Uh, not 0 over 0, it was some non-zero number in the numerator. And so what we do is we'll factor the numerator. Um, what adds to 7 multiplies to 12 would be 3 and 4. So this will factor into x plus 3 times x plus 4. So when you substitute negative 3 in place of x, that's, okay, there's the 0, same as before. But when you put negative 3 in place of x, this is the factor, it's kind of like the culprit. Uh, it's the reason that this worked out to have a 0 in the uh, numerator as well. And so we divide out those x plus 3's, and then we're actually taking the limit just of x plus 4 as x tends toward negative 3. Negative 3 plus 4, of course, equals 1. So the limit of this would be 1. The limit does exist. Uh, if you were to graph this function, you would actually have a hole in the graph at 1, but as you approach from, sorry, at, at negative 3, sorry, but as you approach from either side, the limit would equal 1. And you can graph that and, and check that out, see what it looks like. Uh, for e here, as x approaches negative 2, notice we get a, a 0 value in the denominator again. So let's expand out the uh, numerator. When you square x plus 1, remember that means x plus 1 times another x plus 1. So in the numerator, uh, x squared would be x squared. And then x times 1 doubled is 2x in the middle. And then on the end, 1 squared is 1. So when you expand the 3 in, 3 times x squared is this. 3 times the 2x would be this 6x. And 3 times the 1 would be this 3 on the end here. So that's where those terms all come from. Um, removing the brackets, of course, uh, all those terms in the x plus 5 there change sign. So those, that's those terms. And then we'll um, simplify, collecting the like terms together. Uh, 6x minus x is 5x. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Now, if I substitute negative 2 in place of x, and I could have done this right at the top to show this, 3 times negative 2 squared plus 5 times negative 2 minus 2. Well, this is 4 times 3 is 12. So that's 12 minus 10 and then minus 2 in the end. So that notice that the numerator works out to 0 again. So we've got one of those indeterminate forms just like uh, the previous example. And so that means that if we were to factor the uh, numerator, x plus 2 should be a factor because those x plus 2's are what's making the 0 value on the top and the bottom. So now I could factor this using traditional methods, but I, I kind of know that x plus 2 is going to be a factor. So, well, what would the other factor have to be? This x times whatever's here would have to give me this 3x squared. So this would have to start with a 3x. And on the end, uh, 2 times this would give me negative 2. So there has to be a negative 1 here. You can, of course, check that's 6x. That's a minus 1x, so that does add to 5x. So you could check, expand it out just to check to make sure it does work out to 3x squared plus 5x minus 2. 
So now we divide out those x plus 2's, and then we're just taking the limit of 3x minus 1 as x tends towards negative 2. And of course, uh, 3 times negative 2 minus 1, that's negative 6 minus 1 is negative 7. So the limit does exist, and it's negative 7. Now this is another, a different kind of indeterminate form. If x tends towards 0, then certainly the denominator is 0. If we put 0 here, we'd have the root of 9 in the numerator, which is 3, minus 3 is 0. So once we get in, we get a 0 in the numerator. So what you do when you have one of those radical expressions like this is you multiply the uh, numerator and denominator both by, and it, this is called the conjugate of this. It's the same expression as this, except in between the root and whatever terms in the end, we have the opposite sign. Now, if you multiply uh, top and bottom by the same thing, of course, it, uh, it doesn't change the value, because really I'm multiplying by 1 here. You multiply something by 1, it keeps the same value. Now, when you multiply these together, uh, the conjugates multiply to give you actually a fairly simple short term. Uh, the root of 9 plus x times the root of 9 plus x, those two roots are the same, that works out to be just 9 plus x. Because remember, really the roots sort of cancel one another out and you just get what's underneath the root. Now when you multiply negative 3 by the root of 9 plus x, and I'll write this down, you actually get negative 3 root 9 plus x. So that's that product right there. This product right here would be plus 3 root 9 plus x. And so notice that these are opposites, and they would add to 0. So that's why, really, we just have the product of these, which is the 9 plus x here. And then the other product, of course, is the negative 3 times positive 3, which is this negative 9 here. So that's why the top simplifies to that. In the denominator, we just have x times the conjugate, the root 9 plus x plus 3. Now, notice that these 9s uh, subtract a 0. And so then, after they subtract a 0, we really just have an x left on top and an x in the bottom. And so this x will divide out. Now, there's x goes into x once. So there's a 1 up here. A, a common mistake is to think that it's, it's gone. There's nothing on top. It's a 0. But x divides into x once. So the numerator has a 1 in it. And of course, that conjugate expression is just in the denominator. That x is actually the reason that we were getting a 0 on top and bottom. Because if x is 0, is 0 here. And x is 0, there's a 0 there. So once they divide out, we can evaluate the limit. So as x tends towards 0, this would be the root of 9 plus 0, or the root of 9, which of course is 3. And so this is 3, plus 3 is 6, so the limit is just 1 over 6. And that's the end of the lesson.